From the classroom to the emergency room, OR and beyond, you're joining Trauma ICU Rounds with your host, Dr. Dennis Kim. Hey there, friends. Welcome back to Season 3 of Trauma ICU Rounds. We are super excited to be back. And who better to kick off the season than one Dr. Jean-Louis Vincent, a.k.a. JLV. In the first episode of this two-part series, Dr. Vincent shared with us the importance of avoiding iatrogenicity in the ICU and how important it is for us to give our patients a fast hug daily. In this follow-up episode, we touch upon the original Rivers trial, more recent large multicenter RCTs of early goal-directed therapy, therapeutic nihilism, and get JLV's take on controversial hot topics in the ICU. If you like what you're hearing and we're contributing to your education and care of patients, please make sure to leave us a five-star rating at Apple iTunes, leave a kind comment, and if there are certain topics or guest speakers or professors that you want to hear from, let us know. You can email us at traumaicurounds at gmail.com or send me a DM on Twitter at traumaicurounds or via TikTok at Trauma ICU Doc. Let's jump on in. Now, you brought up some interesting points when it comes to selecting the right outcome for our studies. And so often in ICU critical care medicine, mortality seems to be the, the primary or main outcome uh, measurement. Now, you mentioned Swangans catheters, and it, it's always amazed me. People say, ah, Swangans catheters, they don't improve mortality. Well, it's a diagnostic test, just like someone's SpO2 or like any vital signs you see on a monitor. And so it's not just the, the diagnostic test in itself, but what sort of interventions are you going to do based on appropriate interpretation of the results? And so when it comes to things like uh, pulmonary artery catheters, is this something that you're still monitoring in select patients in the ICU? It's a, it's a difficult question because, uh, of course, the use of the swan gun catheter has, has decreased substantially everywhere. And this is primarily because echocardiography is now widely available and doctors are well-trained to do it. You don't need to call a cardiologist to do an echo. You do it yourself. Forget about your stethoscope if you don't want to use it. But don't forget about the echo probe because you have to use an echo probe. So that's a primary reason uh, for the decreased use of the swan gun catheter. Now, you may not leave the probe all the time, and that's the big advantage of the swan gun catheter. You can monitor the patient. And when I say you, it's not only the doctor, it's also the nurse, of course. They can monitor the patient as often as they want. So in complex cases, primarily patients with respiratory failure plus cardiac failure uh, and, you know, difficult ventilatory conditions, high PEEP levels, etc., cetera, um, it, 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 it can be helpful. Now, if in your department you have a relatively small number of beds and if you use the swan gun scatter only once in a while, it's probably better to avoid it altogether. Because if it becomes, again, a big issue for the nurses, <gasps> a swan gun scatter, where is it? How do we, oh my gosh, I haven't done it for 15 days. No, no, then you are going into the iatrogenic aspects and forget about this. But if you use it regularly, our nurses love it uh, because we use it, re- not often, but regularly. And so they think it's part of their work, part of their job to interpret the data and apply what uh, what they see. Now, when you say it has not been shown to decrease mortality rate, uh, you gave the answer yourself. It's just a monitoring technique. But even, let me go back to the point, even treatments show me what has been shown to decrease mortality. And so I'm so obsessed by this question that we did a literature review that we published recently, just one year ago, in Critical Care Medicine. And we found that, again, iatrogenicity, uh, when it's avoided, uh, could contribute to a lower mortality rate. Low tidal volume, no mechanical ventilation, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, high oxygen flow, uh, oxygen, uh, you know, this kind of things that can, or prone positioning in severe LDS, it's also to avoid iatrogenicity. But in terms of things that can really 
benefit the patient and decrease mortality. There is nothing. You know, uh, decontamination of the GI tract, it's still controversial. Uh, corticosteroids in septic shock, I think there is enough evidence that would be an exception. But there are people who debate this, who say, no, uh, corticosteroids, uh, it doesn't really decrease mortality rate in septic shock. So it's still, even that is still debated, and there is nothing else. Take the point of transfusions. In trauma, it's a big issue. When to transfuse a patient? Ask the resident, like many experts, They will say, you just look at the hemoglobin level. If it's not below seven, don't give blood. And now I have an elderly patient with severe trauma in my department, and she is 85, and she has a history of myocardial infarction, and the EKG is a bit abnormal, and there are some arrhythmias, and the lady looks terrible. You would like to mobilize her a little bit, but and she has a hemoglobin of 7.8. You will not transfuse that lady? Of course you will, because you will use your brain. If you look only at the hemoglobin level, you don't need a doctor. The information will come from the lab. Each time there is a hemoglobin below 7, the lab will say, oh, oh, you can transfuse here, and otherwise there would be no transfusion. It doesn't make sense. (laughs) Once again, we are back to the, the doctor having a brain at the bedside and using his brain. And so when you look in very large databases, um, you can identify that some patients can benefit from from blood transfusions when there is moderately anemic and when they have signs of altered tissue perfusion. We also published a paper recently, which was a meta-analysis of transfusions in, uh, in critical states, showing that in septic shock, Blood transfusion sometimes can help to increase oxygen consumption and therefore probably help the cells to have more oxygen. But if you want a prospective randomized control trial, it will be based on hemoglobin levels. And we all agree we should not decide to transfuse only on the basis of a hemoglobin level. So what else? Well, I gave you the example. It's difficult. How do you quantify these uh, uh, problems of cardiovascular disease, abnormal EKG, etc.? It, it's difficult to quantify all this. So you can learn more from large databases, looking at patients who were transfused and patients who were not transfused, and you can then figure out who could benefit the most. From, uh, from the blood You know, the, the whole notion of transfusions for patients in septic shock, I mean, physiologically and theoretically, in my mind, you're going to potentially optimize their O2 carrying capacity and delivery. And you talked about the effect on consumption. And this was part of the original Rivers trial was to actually transfuse to uh, target hematocrit. But it seems like when we review the data and the studies, uh, that's probably the, the least important thing. It's, it's the early recognition and starting all the therapy. So it's, it's very interesting that you bring that up. And I like how you talked about individualized or personalized medicine, because I, I do believe, you know, the decisions that are made at the bedside by the ICU team for each patient is going to vary depending on their underlying protoplasm, past medical history, and what's happening with the patient at the present time. And so when you talk about patients and trying to assess tissue perfusion, does this patient need a transfusion? Do they need a bolus? We've already kind of mentioned PACs, but what are you doing at the bedside to assess for things like fluid responsiveness? You mentioned echo, but in addition to that, are we looking at capillary perfusion? Are you looking at passive leg raising techniques? What are you doing in your ICU and what are you teaching your fellows and residents? Well, you, you are covering many aspects there because uh, w- when you say some people insist on the early recognition of, uh, of sepsis, of course, this is true. But one thing does not exclude another one. And so we need to pay attention to every single component of our, of our uh, management. And um, indeed, in the river study, it was basically on septic shock. There were three interventions to increase oxygen delivery, give more fluids, give some transfusions, and give some dobutamine. And if you look at the two groups, it was primarily the amount of fluids given over the first six hours. And you allude to that, 
the amount of blood transfusion. The differences were very, very significant for blood transfusions. And they were very small for the butamine. The butamine was used only in 13% of the, uh, of the treated group in the river study. Now, that river study was uh, um, challenged in large prospective randomized control trials, which eventually showed that early goal directed therapy does not reduce mortality rate in septic shock. So it's another intervention, uh, you know, that you can eliminate if you like. But most of these patients in these three large trials were already resuscitated when exactly. they were uh, enrolled in, in the trials. So how could you resuscitate them more if it. they were already resuscitated with an SCBO2, which was within the normal range? So to address your last question about the, or latter question, about the uh, how to um, manage and optimize oxygen delivery, I like to look at SCVO2, at central venous oxygen saturation, not necessarily too early, actually. From the river study, our thoughts have evolved. And now, and I wrote an editorial in chest on this uh, a few months ago, uh, I say going from early goal directed therapy to late SCVO2 checks. So if the patient is not improving, then I look at SCVO2. And if it's significantly below 70%, it's a clue to indicate that I should really do something to increase oxygen delivery. Fluids, perhaps blood transfusion, if the patient is a bit anemic with the risks that we know, and perhaps a little bit of the butamine. Even though calac output may not be very low, if the patient does not tolerate fluids, you can just try a little bit of the butamine, what I call the butamine challenge. And we can see if the tissue perfusion improves, look at the skin perfusion, look at urine output. Uh, that's that's how we could, we could do it. Now, the, the best way to give fluids without problems is to use a fluid challenge technique. So you need to give a fluid bolus over a short period of time, five to 10 minutes, and you measure the benefit and the risk. The benefit is the increase in cardiac output in the septic patient, or simply the increase in blood pressure in the hypovolemic patient. After all, in the immediate resuscitation of the polytrauma victim, what do you what do we do? We give fluids and we check the blood pressure and we see if the blood pressure is increasing because there is a direct relation between the volume status and the blood pressure in the bleeding patient. In, septi in sepsis, it becomes a bit more complicated because the patient is easily vasodilated. So sometimes calac output can increase, but the blood pressure will not increase. So there, it's better to measure the uh, the calac output by the technique you like. Uh, we spoke about this one, Gun Skeletor. It's not necessary to use that. In Europe, many people would use the pulsion system uh, or litco system, which is the same, the litco system, or the uh, pico system. The pico system is the same. Uh, and uh, we could even uh, use uh, echo looking at the uh, calac output but we need to be a little bit experts in ECHO to do that. It's not always that easy. Uh, the, and the risks, that's the central venous pressure. We need to look at it, not as a, an absolute value. No, 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 as a relative value. So if you see that calac output does not seem to increase, tissue perfusion does not seem to increase, but the central venous pressure went from 8 to 12, maybe it's time to stop and uh, rethink a little bit the fluid administration. However, if there is even a minimal increase in uh, improvement in tissue perfusion, but the central venous pressure stays at eight, oh, maybe you can try a bit more. And uh, because really the risk uh, doesn't seem to be so immense if the central venous pressure does not increase. And um, and uh, so that, that's how I use the SVO2 monitoring, primarily in septic patients, but I sometimes use it in trauma patients too, because as we know, in polytrauma, 
sometimes the uh, there is a huge release of mediators and it's a sepsis like uh, state as well the situation can be very complex with a lot of mediators around i always emphasize this trauma is multifactorial and associated with a huge SERS response especially when there's so much tissue injury involved oh yeah 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 uh, I, I was thinking i missed something the passive leg raising test I love it. Physiologically, it makes sense. You raise the legs and the abdomen. It's not really leg raising. It's legs and abdomen right. by moving the bed. Okay. It's some kind of rever- reversible fluid challenge. Okay. Good. Right. But the amount of fluids that you will move is still relatively limited, and the response will be very transient. So we all know how to change the position of the bed. That's easy, very easy. But what do you measure? Not blood pressure, my friend. No, 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 no. You need to measure transient increases in stroke volume. So you still need your monitoring system to monitor cardiac output. So it sounds easy. And many people, I have seen it throughout the world, change the best position, and then they look at blood pressure. It's, oh, blood pressure increases, so the patient needs fluid. No! Read the articles describing the passive leg raising test. You should not look at blood pressure. And the patients may be a bit stressed by your test. You know, you are lying flat in the bed, and suddenly mm-hmm. you, you, you feel your legs going up. You know, you are a little bit stressed, not much, but enough to raise your blood pressure and your heart rate, and then you lose your signal. So the passive leg raising test is great, but you must know how to do it, and you must be ready to use the proper technique to evaluate the changes in stroke volume. If you like, you can look at the same kind of uh, discussion we are having here on our eChats. You go to the EasyChem website, go to eChats, and I have an eChat with uh, Xavier Monet, who is really the international expert on this. And he describes very, very well, in 10 minutes, these are short e-chats. In 10 minutes, he describes very well how to do it. And many people don't do it right. The fluid challenge too, and the fluid challenge, many people don't do it right. They say, oh, give one liter in half an hour, and we will see. That's not a fluid challenge, my friend. The fluid challenge consists in giving a relatively small amount of fluid in a short period of time, and evaluating what you do. So it's it, it's not so easy to do it properly, but it can bring a lot of good. <laughs> it, can, it can really help to uh, provide the best management to your patient. Very well stated. And yes, Dr. Monet's written several papers oh, yeah. on the sort of step-by-step yep. process in terms of positioning, monitoring you need to do to assess the response to this fluid Correct. challenge. And I do like the point about the the bolus or fluid bolus challenge as well. So often you say, well, let's assess their fluid responsiveness. And then you look at the pump and 999, there's a liter of saline going in over an hour. And so much happens with our patients in the course of an hour. So if you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. So we'll include a link to that e-chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As- there is an open access paper in critical care on um, on the um, passive leg raising that was published a couple of years ago now. And we also have a paper on how to do a fluid challenge in critical care. It's the very last one of last year. So it was, a, it was published at the very end of 2020, fluid challenge. I wrote it with Kekoni and the Bakker. And we have a little scheme uh, to show you how to do it. Because... Too many people do it uh, in, in the wrong way, as you say, as you say. And I think one point to emphasize uh, for listeners is that, again, when you're assessing fluid responsiveness, if at the end of the challenge, your patient is fluid responsive, that is very different from them actually needing fluids. Correct. So I think oftentimes we see, oh, they're fluid responsive. Let's just reflexively give some more fluids. That might not be the right answer. It just tells you that they will respond if you give them a challenge or more fluid. Yeah, but that's a question you should you should raise before you do the test. You should good point. Say, could this patient benefit from fluid? Because I'm concerned about the peripheral perfusion. I'm concerned about the tissue perfusion of this patient. So if the patient can benefit from fluids, I'm going to give some fluid. 
And the advantage of the fluid challenge is that you evaluate and you treat at the same time. Because if the patient benefits, you can see it, but you get fluids at the same time. But the important message is also the other way around. If the patient does not benefit from fluid administration, stop it. Don't say, well, I'll try another 500. No! If the patient does not benefit, stop it, period. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned coming in in the mornings after your, your time off and not getting upset about things that have gone on overnight, but sometimes you come in and patients are 10, 12 liters positive because they seem to respond and, and the urine output went up. So we continue to give more and more and more. And at some point we have to stop the madness. You know, when it comes to DO2 or oxygen delivery for our, our younger listeners, again, this is really a product of your cardiac output and your oxygen carrying yeah. capacity. And Dr. Vincent has mentioned the idea of augmenting preload, which is oftentimes the quickest and easiest thing to do. You want to make sure your patients are saturating well, that they're not anemic. And then at some point, you may consider improving their contractility with the, the DOB challenge, as was mentioned. Dr. Vincent, you did mention these large trials, the process trials arise, all these sort of you know international prospective, huge trials. And one of the concerns I have, or one of the things that I've noticed, is that there seems to be this aversion to placing central lines and A lines because uh, you don't need to monitor an SVO2. And, and, you know, Dr. Merrick wrote a paper showing that uh, CVP is useless. It's like a coin flip. I feel like somehow we've moved away from looking at some of these, what I feel are key measures and what I've noticed is that now we get calls to help put in central lines in the middle of the night from our colleagues who are non-surgical. Is this a problem that you're seeing or do you feel like we've moved too far away? Has the pendulum swung too far away from invasive monitoring in these patients, particularly with septic shock? No, no, uh, I agree. The, the pendulum has swung uh, too far away, but also people took uh, advantage of all these negative studies to criticize everything, and at the end, to do nothing. Yeah. Um, because t tell me any hemodynamic variable. I could say heart rate. Oh, I don't care about heart rate, you know. Heart rate can move up. It's just a good reaction. When I do some exercise, I have tachycardia. Okay, okay, okay. What about the central venous pressure? Ah, no, no, no evidence it helps. What about... Uh, but at the end, the blood pressure is the same thing. It's, if you say... Uh, especially with respect to uh, septic shock, you know, there have been several studies randomizing patients for a somewhat higher blood pressure or a somewhat lower blood pressure. No difference in mortality rate. So don't measure blood pressure. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't improve survival to measure it. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, passive leg raising test, no evidence. I mean, you, you can do it with right. everything. Yes. So you can just sit down or go to bed <laughs> and um, and forget about your patient and hope that the patient will get better by himself or herself. We, we need to be realistic and understand the physiology first, you know, because that's, that's the wonderful thing about critical care medicine. It is that we apply physiology at the bedside. Absolutely. We try to understand what's going on with the patient. What are the abnormalities? that we need to correct and the abnormality is that we may not need to correct, you know, giving a beta blocking agent in patients with septic shock may kill the patient if the fast heart rate is there to compensate for a low stroke volume. Then you give the beta blocking agent, you slow down the heart rate, you slow down the cardiac output and you just kill the patient. So, uh, you know, and, and I was at the meeting recently where again, someone was saying, oh, there is a, great interest for blood blocking agent in septic shock, and we do it more and more often. But he didn't speak about the physiology. He didn't speak about making sure that cardiac output is indeed supranormal, is quite high, perhaps in an excessive stress response. Ah, 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 now I understand. Okay, okay, okay. Then I understand the situation where you may be ready to give some beta blocking agent, but not just because the heart rate is fast. So you see, 
Uh, and, and we should not focus on one single variable. That's a very important message for the younger people who are listening to us. You know, the lactate levels, you can also throw them away as, ah, oh, lactate, oh, no, no. But don't look at them in isolation. They move too slowly to be considered in isolation. But when you integrate the blood lactate levels with the other variable, they become very helpful. I just wrote a piece in uh, the current opinion in clinical medicine on how lactate levels could be helpful. It was in septic shock in that case because it should not guide therapy. But if I feel that my patient is improving and if the lactate levels do not go down after one hour, after two hours, (gasps) I may be too optimistic, you see? And if I think, oh, this patient is improving, uh, but but the lactate levels do not go down, there is something fishy there. Uh, Something is not right. And we need to be humble and realize that we perhaps miss something. It may be the right time to go back to the CT scanner or to call the surgeon again or whatever to do something else for the patient. But that patient is not improving solely. So there are so many clinical pearls there. Let's just sum that all up. Don't look at values or physical exam findings in isolation. You want to look at your entire right. patient. And it's also about trends. So yes, words of wisdom from Dr. Yeah. Dr. Vincent. So as we look to the future, Dr. Vincent, what are some of the, the major challenges you see for us as, as intensivists? And what are some of the sort of key discoveries or therapeutics that are on the horizon that you feel might be game changers or improve our care delivery for the most critically ill of patients? Well, um, what I would welcome the most, I also fear it the most, and that's artificial intelligence, because I think that all the discussions we are having here could be eventually yeah. put in a program and a computerized system could learn by itself. And that's wonderful. That's fantastic to see how the technology will really help us to treat the patients better. As you say, looking at trends, warning us in advance, saying, you know, you hardly looked at this slight decrease in blood pressure and slight increase in heart rate. But when I put it together, I think this patient is getting worse and uh, the alarm will go on before we even realize that anything is wrong with the patient. So I welcome this wholeheartedly, and I fear it at the same time, because it means that the doctor then will no longer be required at the bedside. The doctor will not be necessary, because everything will run by itself. So it's very exciting, and it's very worrisome at the same time. But let's let's indeed welcome these new technologies, and, uh, and again, um, consider that it will uh, improve the care of the critical ill patient. We will forget less things. We will no longer need these checklists uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, simple reminders because all of this will be much more elaborate. So it will still be uh, interesting to work in the ICU. And we may actually learn from the, from the AI system. <laughs> because the AI will tell us to do something. We say, oh, yeah, that's that's actually quite clever. I should give a transfusion and the hemoglobin level is not that low. But that's a good idea because it's true that the peripheral perfusion is not that good after all. And the patient is a little bit disoriented here. Maybe there is decreased cerebral perfusion, et cetera, et cetera. So we will learn ourselves <laughs> from the process of care. And that's really wonderful. Clinical care medicine is the best specialty on earth. We cannot find anything. Yeah, better. no, I completely agree with that sentiment. And it's interesting. I'm not sure what your thoughts are, but... When I hear people say, oh, all of a sudden, or the patient, all of a sudden, this happened. In my mind, (laughs) I say nothing just all of a sudden happens in critical care medicine. There's always a prodrome, uh, right? There's always a prodrome, and it might be very subtle, you know, like heart rate variability or, or, or other things, glucose dysregulation. But there's usually something that precedes those sudden acute events. And so 
AI in the future. I think several places are actually already starting to use AI and just with the implementation of EHRs and these banners and flags and warnings, it really seems to be the start of, of, of something different. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to just do a quick little rapid rounds. I was going to make a couple of statements, about five or 10 of them, and I just wanted to have you answer yes or no. And I wanted to get your insight on a couple of what I feel are, are controversial things in the world of critical care, if that's okay. Yep, sure. Metabolic cocktail for septic shock, yes or no? Um, no, not really. The evidence is not there. Corticosteroids for septic shock? If it's severe, yes, the evidence is there. Look at the, the Australian study, which is supposed to be negative, but the patients were not in all in septic shock by far. They recently published another paper in anesthesiology focusing on the sicker patients, and they found the same uh, think as Anand did in the French study, in severe septic shock, corticosteroids can indeed be beneficial. Don't miss that opportunity. Completely agree. And do you add fludrocortisone or not? Fludrocortisone, no. I, I, I don't think it's necessary. My good friend Anand would say yes, but uh, <laughs> I'm not convinced. Albumin and Lasix versus Lasix alone. Well, it it depends. Um, it depends. If if the patient is uh, has a relatively large plasma volume, if the patient is in hypervolemia, I, I try not to use the word fluid overload because I wrote an editorial on this recently saying it would be better to avoid the terms because we don't know what we mean when we say fluid overload. So um, if, if we feel that there is no room for... Um, for albumin, but we want to give albumin, then we give albumin plus Lasix. If it's just to combat uh, edema and increase diuresis, then uh, Lasix alone is sufficient. So in the albumin plus Lasix combination, it's the Lasix which is added to albumin. Now, you could ask, is there a place for albumin administration in some critical ill patients? And the answer is yes. Again, as for transfusion, not based only on albumin levels, but based on the presence of edema with low albumin levels and with the risks of further complications. There may be room in some patients for albumin supplementation. Procalcitonin as a screen for sepsis and to guide de-escalation of antibiotics. Well, it's, uh, it's yes to both. Now, the question is, can't you use C-reactive protein, CRP, for this? Uh, in uh, many places in Europe, including ours, we look essentially at CRP, and we are not convinced that PCT is so much superior to CRP. I know that there are some people who will yell at me and say, <laughs> that's not true, PCT is much, much better. Well, uh, it could be a pro and con debate. But PCT, even though are not very costly, they still cost about you know fifteen dollars per measurement. And when you multiply it by the number of tests you do over the year, it's quite a large amount of money. I believe in individualized discontinuation of antibiotics instead of giving uh, should be seven days, should be ten days. Why don't we look at the patient, look at the host response, and if indeed the host response is declining nicely, we could perhaps shorten the duration of antibiotic therapy. So I love that approach, and PCT can be used for that, but um, maybe CRP too. And that wraps up our interview with the one and only Dr. Jean-Louis Vincent. If you like what you're hearing, please be sure to share with your friends. Also, visit us at the Apple iTunes Store. Be sure to leave a kind comment as well as a five-star rating. It really does help us with our visibility and to increase the exposure of our show. Until next time, please stay safe, keep reading, take care of yourselves, and one another. <laughs>